Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ivan and, uh, and Roberto. Uh, all right, so it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Morris Hurley. Uh, Morris is, is actually one of the ver very first few people that I met uh, in, in, my, in my career in OPODIS 2005. Hard to believe it's 16 years ago. Um, he is the Anne Wine Professor of Computer Science at Brown University. Um, he has a degree in mathematics from Harvard and a PhD from, uh, from MIT. He has served on the faculty of, uh, of CMU and, and as the staff of the Cambridge Research Lab. Um, Morris has a long list of prizes and, and recognitions, uh, among which is the 2003 Dijkstra Prize, the 2004 Godel Prize, 2008 uh, IC, uh, ISCA Influential Paper Award, uh, the 2012 Dijkstra Prize, uh, 2013 um, Wallace McDowell Award. Uh, he received the 2012 uh, Fulbright Distinguished Chair in the National Sciences and Engineering Lecturing Fellowship. Um, besides all of that, what uh, we know more is, as is um, two pieces of work that everybody in distributed computing knows, uh, which are uh, the, the notion of linearizability, uh, the topological uh, reasoning techniques uh, for distributed systems, uh, transactional memory. Uh, these are just a few of things that, um, that Morris has done, seminal work, and the community has built um, a lot of work on top of it. So it's again my great pleasure to introduce Morris, and um, I cannot wait to hear your talk. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank uh, Borzu and the team for <clears throat> inviting me to virtual Chicago. Let me set up my screen share here. Okay, I, I assume everyone can see my screen here. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to describe uh, joint work with my colleagues, uh, <coughs> Barbara Liskoff and Luba Shrira, <coughs> and my student, uh, Inge uh, Shui. So I'm going to talk about uh, something that we call adversarial uh, commerce, which um, it's going to start out sounding somewhat exotic, but eventually it's going to look very familiar. So uh, here we have uh, <clears throat> our friend Bob, who runs a theater. And we have friend <clears throat> Alice, who is willing to pay for theater tickets. And um, sorry, Carol has the theater tickets and Alice is a ticket broker. Now, all of this happens in the future when everything of value lives on a blockchain or some form of distributed ledger. And so our goal here is to set up a deal where Carol pays 101 coins to Alice, the broker. Alice uh, takes her commission and forwards the 100 coins to Bob who then sends the tickets to, to Carol. So this is uh, an indirect uh, transfer where uh, Bob and Carol uh, don't necessarily know about each other directly. They both interact through Alice. And uh, this is the way a lot of uh, commerce in the real world is uh, done. So it's not a direct uh, transfer. It's uh, you're going through a well-known uh, market maker. And if we can, do this kind of exchange, then everyone is uh, happy. You know, we've uh, you know increased the uh, utility. You know, done everything that um, improved everyone's uh, situation. Now, of course, this is hard to do, especially if you are working on uh, technology such as uh, blockchains, because nobody trusts anybody, and typically for good reason. Uh, when we say that uh, Bob and Carol don't know each other, 
uh, that is on the one hand, that's uh, great because it says that they can uh, both uh, do, do well without having you know, social connections. On the other hand, who knows who they are? Uh, you know, what kind of a scammer could they be? So it could be that uh, Carol is plotting to steal Bob's coins. <clears throat> it could be that um, Bob is trying to get the tickets for free. Uh, Alice, you know, could be uh, faking it. She could just be an agent of chaos. You know, she's trying to create as much uh, disruption as uh, possible. And the goal here is to make sure that everything works uh, even if the parties, even if everyone, or at least most of the people <clears throat> in the deal are trying to pick one another's pockets. Now, right now I'm being deliberately vague about the correctness conditions that we're looking for because defining these correctness conditions is the point of the talk. So I'm going to set up the problem, talk about some examples, talk about various concerns, talk about why the traditional notions of correctness uh, aren't sufficient for this kind of uh, environment. And then uh, try to make some steps towards finding uh, more, uh, more suitable conditions. So what could go wrong? Well, one thing that could go wrong is that <clears throat> Bob uh, transferred his tickets and uh, he didn't get paid, possibly because Alice and Carol were conspiring against him. After all, you know, it may be a Sybil uh, attack. Maybe Alice and uh, Carol are the same person. Uh, so we say, well, this is whatever our protocol does, this should be unacceptable. Where an honest uh, Bob uh, uh, try, tries to uh, exchange his uh, tickets for uh, money and doesn't get the money. What else could go wrong is uh, Carol could uh, pay for the tickets and not get them, you know. And uh, that could happen maybe by accident. It could happen as a result of uh, nefarious plotting by uh, Alice and Bob. And that's also unacceptable. Uh, it could be that Alice, something goes wrong and Alice ends up having custody of both the tickets and the coins. Now, maybe Alice is dishonest and she's going to uh, go have a night on the town or maybe she's honest and she's distressed because now she has to figure out some way to return the coins and the tickets uh, so as not to uh, damage her uh, reputation as a broker. Uh, but this is also uh, clearly an unacceptable uh, outcome. Now, a, another possible outcome is that uh, the deal doesn't go through. Something uh, goes uh, wrong and <clears throat> this, is actually acceptable. So if the something breaks, then one acceptable outcome is to say, well, nothing happened. No money changed hands, no assets changed hands. And this isn't an outcome that we want, but this is an outcome we are willing to accept as uh, something that, uh, that we want to live with. So more generally, uh, we, in a situation where we have a number of parties who don't know and trust one another, and there is mutual economic benefit if they cooperate with each other, but they don't trust each other, and there's no enforcement. Uh, there's no, all of the instruments of civilization, uh, you know, lawyers, courts, police, have uh, no power in uh, this domain. So we need to, to set things up in such a way that bad things don't happen to begin with because we have no mechanism for rolling back the effects of uh, bad transactions. And so the idea here is something that we call a, a cross-chain deal, uh, which is distantly related to distributed transactions. And we'll explore exactly how uh, that um, relationship works. But we have a number of parties who own assets. You know, an asset could be cryptocurrency, could be a token representing a stock, it could be a token representing real estate, uh, automobiles, any item of value. And they want to trade them with their uh, counterparties. And we want to do things like we can do direct swaps, we can do indirect swaps, as in the brokerage, uh, the ticket broker example that we saw before, we can do auctions, 
we can do options, we can do futures, all of the instruments of modern finance uh, we would want to be able to do in this kind of adversarial uh, decentralized uh, world. Now we're going to assume that each asset lives on its own database or blockchain. Uh, again, the, the um, correct abstraction here is a ledger. A blockchain refers to a particular technology. Uh, you know, we're not uh, wedded to that, although I'm going to talk about blockchains just to be specific. But it could also be a replicated, high-speed, secure, uh, tamper-proof database. Uh, it could be some technology that hasn't uh, been invented yet. A lot of existing technologies that call themselves blockchains are not technically chains of blocks, but they still call themselves that, so you know what they're talking about. And the important thing here is that parties are autonomous. Uh, each party can do what it wants. Each party can follow the protocol, not follow the protocol. Uh, each party can cheat, lie, and steal. So it's a much more demanding environment than uh, our conventional notions of distributed computing. And again, nobody trusts anyone. And I want to argue that uh, this is not a passing fad. Uh, there is a lot of uh, skepticism towards specific instances of blockchains. You know, people who... Um, you know, there are all, all kinds of people who disparage a Bitcoin, there are people who disparage this blockchain, that blockchain, there are people who say that the entire blockchain decentralized finance space is uh, one big a scam. Uh, but that doesn't really need to concern us here. So I'm not concerned here with specific technologies, although of course these are important when you need to uh, execute something. Uh, and really, it doesn't matter if uh, blockchains fall out of a favor and uh, are replaced by something else. Uh, what's really important is that we have this, you know, people are, are going to want to do commerce. People are going to want to do commerce on the internet. People are going to want to do commerce with parties they, that, that they don't trust. The international and uh, anonymous nature of these interactions means that uh, recourse to uh, legal action and enforcement uh, will be imperfect at the best. And so the, the, what we're interested in here is kind of the underlying science of how do you do commercial activities among parties that uh, don't trust one another and have no ability to enforce uh, deals after the fact. Now, um, since all of you <clears throat> are familiar with uh, distributed computing, you know that it's common to formulate problems in terms of an adversary. So really what we want is fault tolerance for some notion of faults and some notion of tolerance. Uh, one way to think about this is to say, well, imagine that we have a, uh, an adversary who is trying to frustrate our purposes. Uh, it may be trying to steal things, maybe trying to delay things, uh, generally causing grief. We are going to design our systems, our protocols, our algorithms uh, with this adversary in mind. Now in classical distributed computing, uh, we have kind of a cute and manageable adversary. Uh, we talk about algorithms that uh, tolerate timing failures, uh, crashes, uh, mission failures, and in the limit Byzantine failures, which are generally viewed as kind of hardware uh, uh, malfunctions. The problems that we want to solve are uh, typically very, um, precisely stated bounded mathematical problems. We want to do consensus. We want to do case set agreement. We want to do state machine replication. Uh, these are very clearly defined problems so we know when they're solved. Uh, everything is in some sense uh, very uh, precisely uh, defined. And you know this, this is a virtue and this is the result of a lot of work by a lot of people for a long time. Uh, but the modern world is, the adversary is uh, much more uh, sinister. Uh, the adversary to your system might not be a malfunctioning sensor somewhere or an overloaded uh, network switch. Uh, it might be a hacker. It might be a hacker that is uh, funded by a state-sponsored uh, agency that has lots of money uh, that is trying to cause as much chaos as possible and not dissuaded by, uh, you know, rational economic incentives. 
So the um, adversary, you know, may not be content with simply, um, you know, crashing your system or stealing your money. They may be trying to create as much social disruption as as possible. So this is a much um, much more demanding adversary. Uh, the kinds of attacks are uh, much more sophisticated. So the good attackers don't respect abstraction boundaries. And for this reason, uh, you typically have to look at the system as a whole to guard against all of these uh, very sophisticated uh, kinds of approaches. The problems that you're trying to solve uh, are you know, social problems, uh, big system problems, uh, problems that are hard to pin down in a mathematical uh, sense. So it's much more of an arms race than a uh, geometry theorem. Uh, you can fix or ameliorate one problem and uh, your adversary comes up with a better attack, which you need to uh, reiterate. So in some sense, uh, things are never, uh, never really over. And what we want to do is we want to say, well, what does it take to do commerce in this kind of uh, open-ended, uh, against this kind of open-ended adversary, where we know very little about the adversary, but the adversary has lots of uh, resources uh, at its uh, disposal. So what I wanna argue in this talk is that our conventional notions of correctness for um, atomic transactions and distributed systems aren't adequate for this uh, much more challenging and uh, you know, somewhat ill-defined uh, world. <clears throat> the problems that we're looking at are important problems that <clears throat> are not going to go away uh, regardless of uh, changes in technology. But the way we think about these things uh, also has to uh, undergo a, uh, a change. And of course, being a keynote talk, I'm going to uh, raise more questions than answers. Uh, sometimes it's pure laziness and time limits, and sometimes uh, nobody actually knows the answer. So if you look in uh, any of the classic textbooks on distributed transactions, uh, they uh, list these acid properties, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And the temptation is to say, ah, well, these were good enough for, um, when I was in grad school, they should be good enough for us now. You know, the, these are eternal truths that uh, we should uh, bear in mind as we set forward into this uh, the challenging world. And I'm going to argue that this isn't actually true. Some of my objections are fairly fundamental. Some of them may seem a little bit pedantic, but even the pedantic uh, exceptions are um, important because if we want to argue that we're correct, we better be using the correct notion of correctness. And so the um, naively taking the classical properties as your correctness condition uh, will um, uh, not deter or frustrate our adversaries. So uh, there's been a lot of work on adversarial models. Uh, fault models, uh, you know, we started out with, uh, you know, crashes, uh, then moved on to Byzantine. Uh, there is a lot of elaborate uh, notions. Uh, Paxos and RAF, the two most popular state machine replication practical algorithms, you assume that the majority uh, doesn't uh, crash. And then there's some, you know, complication about, you know, partitions. Uh, most Byzantine protocols say, well, we're fine as long as uh, more than two thirds of the participants uh, behave themselves. And sometimes two thirds is uh, higher depending on the specific uh, protocol that you're looking at. Uh, there's some very nice work on saying, well, uh, splitting things into Byzantine versus well-behaved is uh, naive. Sometimes we have Byzantine who misbehave altruistic, who always behave and rational, who behave if they're incentivized to, to do so. And what I wanna argue is that none of these is really adequate for the kind of um, world that we need to be able to do um, this, this kind of adversarial commerce. So I'm gonna say, I'm going to divide parties, we'll say conforming parties follow the protocol. So if, um, you know, 
Roberto Borisu, Yvonne An, and I decide to uh, do some kind of a deal, we're going to set up a protocol of the forum. You don't move your money to escrow, you do here, you release this key, and you do that. So there's a default protocol, and anyone who actually follows the protocol is conforming. Uh, I don't care about their motivation. I don't care whether this uh, makes economic sense. I don't care if this is a uh, virtue. If you do what you're supposed to do, you're conforming. And if you're deviating, you could do anything. And here too, uh, I'm not assuming that the deviating parties are rational. Uh, we don't know what their objective functions are. You know, they may be trying to steal your money. They may be trying to uh, destroy your society. Uh, you know, that's of no concern. Either you stick to the protocol or you deviate from the protocol. These are the only distinctions uh, that we need. So this is a very simple uh, model of, uh, uh, of a failure. It says that some number uh, may deviate, some number may uh, conform. There's no bound on the number of deviating parties. Now, in other parts of the system, when we talk about, say, implementing a blockchain, then the rules are different. There you may need two thirds of the uh, uh, BFT participants are correct. But at the commerce level, if I answer some ads on Craigslist and say, oh, let's, let's do a deal, there's no reason to assume that a majority of the other people who want to do a deal are honest. Uh, even, you know, with civil uh, attacks and so on, you know, they might all be the same person uh, playing uh, different uh, roles. So all we're going to do is say that you're either conforming or you're deviating. And for all I know, I might be conforming, but for all I know, everybody else in the deal is deviating. Now, uh, the returning to the classical uh, notions of correctness, uh, the notion of atomicity is key. So atomicity says either all steps happen or none do. You know, I launch a transaction and it commits and everything happens or it aborts and nothing happens. Uh, but all or nothing is impossible to enforce when the transactions are executed by autonomous parties who can't be constrained to follow the protocol. You know, if, if uh, I join in a, uh, some kind of a deal with a, an unknown party and they give me all their money, uh, I can't really prevent that. And my protocol can't prevent that. And if I try to prove the protocol prevents that, it's going to be uh, awkward because it uh, doesn't, because I, I have no control over what they do. So saying that uh, you know, classical atomicity is impossible to realize in a situation where the parties are autonomous. Instead, we're going to refine this and break this down and say, well, if, if all parties conform, then the deal happens. And here, conforming encompasses having your hardware work and so on. So if everything goes well, then uh, the transfers that go through. That's the minimum liveness property you want. And the safety property version of atomicity, it says if some parties deviate, then the conforming parties end up no worse off. You might technically conceivably end up better off, but you won't be worse off. Now, of course, you're all looking at that no worse off and uh, saying, hmm, that looks you know, highly suspicious. What does that uh, mean? Uh, what does it mean to say that if you're honest and conforming that you end up uh, no worse off? Well, of course, it's a complicated subject that uh, I can't exhaust uh, here. Uh, but one way to think about this is to use a little bit of cookbook game theory. You know, nothing terribly profound, but some useful vocabulary. So cross-chain commerce is what game theory people call a cooperative game. And a protocol is a strategy for that game. So a game is a set of steps you can make, a set of uh, you know, state transitions is kind of you know, a shared automaton. And a protocol is a um, strategy that says that I'm going, if this happens, I will do that. And of course, with uh, civil attacks and so on, we assume that parties can form coalitions and uh, they can agree among themselves to follow a strategy, even possibly an, an alternative strategy. And the result to each player of following a strategy is called the payoff. So this is the vocabulary that we use to talk about no worse off. So one payoff, uh, the one that everyone wants, is uh, that uh, the deal happens. 
So uh, the um, vertex in the middle represents a party to the, um, to the deal. Uh, incoming arrows say that everything that the party was expecting to receive, it received. The outgoing arcs say that everything it paid, it paid. And so this is, we commit the transaction, everything happens. A alternative, uh, which we can call no deal says, well, I didn't acquire anything and I didn't pay anything. So I'm exactly uh, where I was uh, before. And this is the analog to aborting the transaction. But in a world where you can't control the behavior of the participants, uh, weird things can happen. Uh, a free ride happens when somebody actually pays me, but I don't pay anyone. Uh, maybe this happened by accident. Maybe I was conforming and this happened. Uh, maybe I'm uh, uh, lying and cheating and I somehow tricked somebody into paying me. So that means I got something for nothing. A discount says that I got everything I expected to get, but I paid less. Somehow uh, an outgoing transfer didn't uh, happen. So this is a, uh, you know, I got something cheaper than expected. Uh, that also uh, can't be, um, even if I'm conforming, that could happen because maybe my recipient uh, deviated uh, somehow. And final, finally is uh, I could have some complex situation where some incoming asset that I expected to receive did not arrive and some outgoing payments uh, didn't happen. And uh, this is a kind of chaotic. So we can rank these from better to worse. So a uh, deal has to be viewed by every participant as better than no deal, because otherwise, uh, why would you uh, join in this uh, deal to begin with? If you're better off doing nothing, you wouldn't do this thing. A discount is better than deal because you uh, get uh, the same thing that you expected to get out of the deal, but you paid less. So uh, that is, that's a, a reasonable assumption that uh, and you would prefer discount to deal. Uh, you would prefer free ride to a no deal uh, because that says that I got something for nothing. You know, maybe, uh, maybe you prefer deal to a free ride because you, you don't want, would have got, ended up uh, happier if you completed the deal, but it's certainly better than no deal. And uh, underwater, uh, where uh, you didn't get everything you expected and you paid uh, something for it is uh, worse than no deal. And so what we're gonna say is no worse off is any of these outcomes and worse off is uh, the chaotic underwater outcome. Now you can dispute this in some cases, you know, some out underwater outcomes may under specialized circumstances uh, be better than no deal, but uh, I'm going to you know, put this out there and um, you know, leave it to future work to kind of refine this. But the point is that you can define uh, these outcomes, you can rank them, and we can argue about uh, the circumstances under which they're, uh, they're applicable. So that's how um, the notion of atomicity needs to be changed. Uh, next is the notion of consistency. So consistency uh, basically states that application specific constraints are respected. On uh, the classical database world, they say, well, this means that the, if I transfer money from one account to another account, then money isn't created or destroyed. There's some invariant that's uh, preserved. Uh, this um, particular um, property has always uh, bothered me somewhat because it's, it's the only one that's kind of, uh, uh, talks about the um, semantics of, of the application. And it, it never seems to be well-defined well from, from my point of view. But um, we're going to replace this with another application-specific property, uh, which is basically that uh, the protocol should be set up so that participants have a rational um, interest in following the protocol. This doesn't mean they will, and this certainly doesn't mean you can assume they will, but you need to set things up so that everything is incentive aligned. So uh, we're gonna use the term strong Nash equilibrium. Uh, here again, everybody picks a common uh, strategy, uh, but if a coalition deviates from the strategy, it won't be better off. 
So a strong Nash, a Nash equilibrium says that no individual is better off by uh, deviating. A strong Nash equilibrium says that no coalition is better off by, by deviating. There are, there's, there are other terms that mean the same thing that uh, game theory people throw around. So this says that, uh, you know, if we conspire to um, uh, deviate, uh, we won't objectively be better off according to this uh, game theoretic ranking. We may do so anyway, because of course, maybe we don't care about that ranking. You know, maybe we have a larger plan that isn't uh, captured by our, uh, by our game theory. So for example, here is a multi-party swap. So each uh, vertex is a party, each arc is a uh, represents a possible transfer of an asset. You know, coins, stamps, sheep, Bitcoin, all of these uh, things. And uh, the idea is that each party, you know, has an asset and they want to atomically transfer to the other party. So you only want to transfer your asset out if you get all your assets uh, in. Now, uh, there's a theorem that says that a protocol that ensures that every conforming party ends up no worse off, that is any protocol that satisfies our atomicity condition is also a strong Nash equilibrium if and only if the directed graph is strongly connected. So this uh, takes the, you know, relates the game theoretic aspects of the deal to the topological properties of this, uh, of this graph. And of course I won't go through the Proof, but I can, you know, there's a, a very clear intuition why this is true. So here is a swap graph that isn't strongly connected. Uh, so here we have uh, the uh, pink part. Uh, there's no path from the pink part back to the yellow part. So these people are in some sense free riders. So they are getting things. Uh, assets are flowing into the subgraph, but nothing is flowing out. So they are acquiring assets uh, without uh, paying for them. And Alice says, well, you know what? If I don't pay Bob, no one's going to notice because I'm not getting anything back from Bob. What happens if he gets angry? Who cares? He's not giving me anything. I'm just going to pretend I pay him and not pay him. And in fact, nobody in the yellow part of the graph is uh, going to, to notice. So Alice gets a better payoff in this case if he deviates from the protocol. So it would be foolish to set up a protocol like this because uh, Alice would probably never agree to join. And if she did join and she's rational, that means she's intending to cheat. So uh, this kind of a thing uh, doesn't uh, make any, any sense. So if we make the graph strongly connected again, then uh, the pink nodes are not free writers anymore because they're paying for the privilege of joining in the protocol. And Alice says, why well, better pay? Because uh, if I don't pay, then uh, bad things will happen. You know, the, the whole uh, thing will, uh, you know, probably uh, abort and uh, no assets will change hands and no one will be better off because that pink version, the pink region of the uh, graph that was formerly disconnected is now connected and it can uh, withhold uh, something that it's supposed to uh, send. So this is that it's a better payoff for Alice to comply. And uh, this is uh, what, uh, what we want. Uh, the next uh, property in the ACID trilogy is uh, isolation. So isolation says that no transaction sees another transaction's intermediate states. And this is uh, important because it says in some sense uh, that um, you know, if you have, it's related to consistency in the sense that if every transaction preserves some invariant, then no transaction will ever see that invariant temporarily violated by another transaction because you either see the um, state world before the transaction or the world after the transaction. And uh, from this um, sort of informally stated, um, uh, we get all kinds of uh, familiar um, Consistency properties like serializability, linearizability, snapshot consistency, and so on. Uh, there's a huge amount of uh, database literature on uh, different kinds of uh, isolation mechanisms, some of which are stronger uh, than others, some of which are easier to implement uh, than others. 
So what is the analog of isolation for um, decentralized commerce? Well, it turns out the classical notions aren't very helpful. That uh, if you look at the actual protocols, now we haven't talked about actual protocols because I don't have time to, to march through them, but typically they take the form, uh, you know, Borzu and I want to do a swap. So uh, I'll put something into escrow. As soon as Borzu sees that I put my asset into escrow, he'll put his asset into escrow. Once I see that Borzu has put his asset into escrow, I'll uh, you know, uh, release the key and so on. So these protocols have a very, you know, it's like a Cold War prisoner exchanges. You know, you do one thing and then someone else does something else. Uh, there is no notion of isolation here. There's a lot of interaction between the parties. So the notions of serializability, linearizability, snapshot consistency, and so on, uh, aren't really appropriate for this kind of environment. Uh, instead, the what I'm going to claim is the natural analog is that once an asset is placed into escrow, it can't be unlocked until the deal is complete. So an escrow account is a uh, intermediate account. So I take an asset that I have custody of that I control and I put it in an escrow account where I no longer control it. It's controlled uh, typically by a smart contract. And this guarantees that I can grab my asset and run it right away at some point. Once it's in escrow, it's like a time lock safe. It says for the next 24 hours, I can't take that asset back. And this gives my counterparty confidence to, uh, to proceed. So the equivalent of a lock in uh, this kind of commerce is an escrow account. But there is another uh, property, which is that assets can't be locked in escrow uh, forever. So these smart contracts are very literal minded programs. And I could say, well, I'm going to put my account in escrow. Now you take your step. And my counterparty says, ha ha, and walks away. Then my account, my, my assets are locked up forever. And uh, that's, that's no good. So you need some kind of timeout that says, well, it seems like the deal fell through. Uh, I'm going to refund everything to everyone. And of course, uh, designing uh, protocols so that timeouts uh, live, you know, can't be abused is a, a tricky a business and people write papers about that kind of thing. But there's a related problem, uh, which uh, does, as far as I can tell, doesn't have any analog in the um, database world, uh, which is called lockup briefing. So the idea is that uh, we have a deal. I put something, I put my assets into an escrow with a timeout and my counterparty uh, walks away. So on the one hand, I get my money back. So I, I'm not uh, uh, stolen, nothing is stolen, but only after a long delay. Uh, timeouts on these protocols tend to be very long. If you're a blockchain, uh, has a say 10 minute transaction time than a typical lockup time is 24 hours. Now, uh, this is unfortunate in the um, fast and furious um, blockchain world because assets are highly volatile. You know, the price of a Bitcoin, uh, you know, goes up and down, uh, uh, you know, stable coins, uh, you know, might, uh, might collapse. And so if your assets are locked up, you might miss the party. So there's a very real cost into having someone, you know, march away while you while, while your assets are locked up. This is, you know, roughly comparable to the motivation for lock resynchronization. If someone locks up a, a data structure and then walks away, then uh, you can't do any business. If somebody locks up all your Bitcoin for 48 hours, then uh, that's an eternity in this space. So um, my uh, PhD student uh, Ying Jie Shui uh, looked at that. And uh, hopefully she'll be on the job market uh, next year. Uh, and came up with a, um, a start to looking at this, something that we call hedged uh, deals. Now, in the real world, you know, if you go to Wall Street and you set up a deal where at some point I can choose to exercise the deal or I can choose to walk away, uh, that's called an option. And I don't get options for free. I pay for an option. So I can go to you and say, okay, I'd like to lock in the price of a million shares of Apple stock for the next 24 hours. And uh, you know, 24 hours from now, I can either buy that stock 
or I can uh, choose not to exercise the option, but I have to pay to do that. And uh, that fee is uh, typically called the premium. So what you would like to say is, uh, if I set up one of these uh, uh, deals, where at some point one party can walk away and leave everyone else inconvenienced, uh, then they should pay a fee. Not to punish the um, wrongdoer, but to compensate the, the victims. Now, if you think about this, then you, you see that there's kind of a nested atomicity problem. So we set up the deal that we want to do, and that requires some kind of atomicity mechanism. But then we want to set up a fee structure so that if somebody walks away from the deal, then they pay the uh, premium, which means putting premiums into escrow. But what if you walk away during the premium escrow? So fortunately, if you nest these deals, sooner or later you get to an amount where you say, actually, I don't mind so much or this, this gets locked up for 48 hours because it's only a dollar. And so there's, uh, there's a lot of very interesting technical questions underneath here. There are general questions, which I think uh, deserve to be looked at in the future. If a deal falls apart, how do you determine who's guilty? There are technical limitations on what smart contracts can do and observe. And so how do you design a protocol so that if somebody abandons it in the middle that they, that they pay the fine? Because don't forget, everyone is trying to uh, steal from you. Uh, what if I can uh, sabotage your protocol and place the blame on someone else? Uh, how do we um, bootstrap the premiums? You know, if I need to, uh, I need to escrow a large amount uh, to make, safeguard that, I then need to escrow a premium. Uh, but how do I safeguard that? So uh, there, there's a, a um, an infinite recursion problem that uh, you know can be partly solved by saying, well, eventually, uh, if it's a one percent deposit at each level, it's small enough to ignore. And <clears throat> to what extent can hedging be automated? Can I write a compiler that takes a uh, protocol for a deal and uh, automatically uh, puts in the hedging fees to uh, uh, compensate uh, victims if uh, something breaks or someone walks away? Uh, these are all kind of open uh, questions. And we have a start on this uh, problem you know, at the uh, last uh, uh, pod seat, which uh, you know, recommend people look at. Okay, um, so to, to kind of wind up, the very last property in the ACID um, list of uh, properties is, a, is the easiest one. Uh, here, this says that committed transactions survive crashes. So this is a kind of high level abstract way of saying, well, uh, for most of the um, you know, late 20th century, memory was divided into fast volatile memory and slow non-volatile memory. And we do all our computation in fast volatile memory uh, and we use the slow memory as a backup, but when things uh, crash, our uh, abstractions are broken. And everyone can see that our volatile memory has gone away and our stable memory has um, survived. So we have elaborate protocols for saying, well, before I commit a transaction, I need to force all of its uh, changes to a non-volatile memory, you know, to basically write things to disk. And so you abstract this by saying, well, if the transaction commits, then even if the participant crashes and comes back up, that we didn't lose the effects of the uh, transaction. So this is um, the same kind of a deal for um, transactions for adversarial commerce. But here we get into a lot of the ideological uh, and sort of doctrinal uh, motivation for things like blockchains is that in addition to crashes, you know, where a volatile memory loses power, we're also concerned with a much larger issues uh, like so-called censorship by governments, corporations, uh, hackers, any kind of power. This says that you should be able to uh, do, to make deals and do commerce, even if your uh, government uh, doesn't uh, like that. Now we can argue about whether that's actually a good idea to have you know, all, this, all this unregulated commerce, and I'm not taking a position on this, uh, but 
to a first approximation, we would like to say that uh, if I do, if I make a deal and uh, I transfer my Bitcoin in return for your uh, NFTs, that uh, this isn't undone uh, by, by hardware failures, uh, by uh, court action, by uh, uh, treachery, uh, by any of the other uh, parties. And so, so this is uh, in some sense, um, a much stronger uh, requirement than uh, what you're we're used to with uh, classical databases, but it's in kind of the same spirit. Okay, so that's the, um, that's pretty much the point of what I wanted to, to say. What, um, you know, we're all familiar with the notions of atomic transactions, uh, you know, these things started in the database world. They went on to distributed systems. Uh, there are lots and lots of uh, different uh, variations of correctness properties, but the acid properties are kind of the standard. Uh, even systems that don't satisfy acid properties, the acid properties are the systems they explain they don't satisfy. Uh, what I want to propose here is that it's, although it's tempting to think that these carry on to the kind of next generation of uh, electronic uh, commerce and uh, blockchains and so on, uh, they really don't. That the, a lot of the work in blockchain world, and people get angry when I say this, is really reinventing classical distributed computing under new names. Uh, but conversely, uh, this uh, blockchain world does add a lot of interesting new twists. In particular, the uh, kind of anarchic, um, you know, hyper Byzantine nature of uh, these interactions. And this means that we need to rethink uh, our properties. Some properties have to be weaker. Uh, we cannot provide all or nothing. You know, it's physically impossible. So we need to figure out what the replacement is. Uh, other properties like uh, sensor shear resistance have to be much, much stronger than uh, the ability to uh, survive uh, power failures and uh, crashes. And each of these things, particularly if you want to formally prove that your system is correct, you need to start with the right specification. And so what I'm trying to do here is to provoke people into uh, rethinking correctness properties. It's okay with me if you want to quibble with the particular uh, properties that I've chosen, uh, but, uh, uh, Whatever, whether you agree with the particulars or not, I want you to, um, I want to kind of challenge the, uh, any degree of complacency you might have in, in terms of your correctness positions. So um, again, I'll go back to a point that uh, I raised before. Uh, there's a lot of uh, controversy and hype uh, about blockchains. Uh, this isn't really about uh, blockchains, although it's convenient to situate uh, this whole uh, thing in a blockchain uh, environment. It's really about the problem of doing commerce. You could replace uh, blockchains with uh, uh, databases and everything I say would uh, basically uh, be, be true. Uh, so the technology is going to change, the applications uh, may change, but the need to uh, reason about your algorithms and the need to uh, choose appropriate correctness conditions isn't uh, going to uh, uh, go away ever. Okay, so um, I guess I have a little bit of time left so I can take questions. I guess the easiest way is just to, what, speak up? Thank you very much, Morris. Um, so that was a virtual applaud. Um, so, um, yes, uh, let's uh, switch to questions. Uh, it, it, either speak up on Zoom or raise your hand on Zoom. We also have a Slack channel. Uh, feel free to post your questions on the Slack channel. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead with the questions. Let's see, yes, so am I on the Slack channel? Um, I can I can read out the the, the questions to you, Morris. On, on Slack. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Why, why don't you do that, Morris? Let me. Uh, this is Roberto um, Palmieri. Let me ask a, a, a scary question. Um, consistency is already complex enough, right? So um, for my verification, 
from my standpoint, became a real thing when people decide to put money on, on consensus algorithms that we used to publish uh, without really being rigorous in verifying them and, and, and making sure that the properties that we claim they're actually uh, provided. Uh, formal verification became so important. Defining algorithms that actually uh, do what we say is critical. When you mentioned Nash equilibrium uh, in reasoning, helping reasoning about the new notion of correctness made me think, uh, how about proving that these properties are then ensured by what we're designing, but our algorithms, we will have to rethink about techniques and proofs and formal verification techniques that are now um, evolving uh, uh, rapidly. Um, have, you, have you thought about that? So, so I'm not really an expert in these conditions, but if I were doing that, this would be paradise because for a long time, formal verification was kind of uh, uh, respected, but not really taken seriously. And now uh, there are literally billions of dollars resting on these protocols. So you bet that the people who are putting their money on the line would be willing to sponsor work in the formal verification. Conversely, I think, uh, Running, putting your money on a blockchain that doesn't have some level of formal verification is uh, crazy. So, uh, you know, plus, you know, verification technology has advanced uh, quite a bit. So this this should be, you know, the golden age of uh, formal uh, verification because you know people care about it. They're huge, um, huge things at stake, and uh, we can now see how to do things that uh, couldn't uh, couldn't be done before. I'm actually a little envious. <laughs> uh, Morris, this is Jennifer Welch. How are you? Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> so um, did you think anything about um, what might make sense for complexity studies uh, in this world? Like, you know, I always see these, these headlines that, you know, Bitcoin uses more energy than a small country or whatever. Oh, oh, oh yeah. So complexity is a completely un unplowed field here. So uh, the, the reason that you know, Bitcoin is uh, hugely inefficient because basically Bitcoin is evil, but uh, it, other um, blockchains that use other kinds of consensus are um, way less evil. There's certainly, uh, there's bounds on, you know, all of these things rely on some form of uh, Byzantine, uh, Byzantine agreement and any lower bounds for Byzantine agreement apply uh, uh, here. For the kinds of commerce things that I'm looking at, there are all kinds of um, unexplored uh, lower bounds, like timeouts. The timeouts on these things tend to be huge because you need to be uh, conservative. And there are ways of avoiding the timeouts that require other kinds of compromises, but <clears throat> nobody has any uh, lower bounds on the complexity of these you know, atomic swap or atomic transaction algorithms. I don't, I have no reason to believe they're hard. It's just such a new area that uh, nobody's uh, worked on it uh, before. And this is also something that is of great interest to practical people because people really do set up uh, these you know, complex uh, cross-chain transactions that were at least uh, planned to. And they right now they use ad hoc uh, mechanisms and uh, nobody knows whether you could improve things. I suspect a lot of them are probably already as good as they can get, but there's no there's zero formal understanding of, of lower bounds and complexity in uh, in the cross-chain uh, protocol uh, area. Other questions? So I, I can follow up with uh, uh, tangential questions that are also related to how we teach about this problem. So uh, when we explain transactions and properties uh, to our students, you know, bank uh, deposit and withdraw is the example they have been using for a long time and kind of still fit certain if we're not talking about blockchain. Now, a lot of the things that you, Morris, said are basically inspired by your own knowledge of finance, business, how to make deals, which are usually not traditional CS, uh, common knowledge, let me say. Um, when, when we review, when we define 
what makes sense as a next property to ensure in our system. It's often comes from these business, literally business requirements. Um, without a, a model to formalize that, what, what, what's good? What's, what's reasonable? What's an, an interesting property to guarantee uh, or to design for? Uh, how do you approach yourself to that problem? So, so, so there is a uh, kind of a progression where you know you start out and say, well, we want to do we want to do a, a cross chain swap, and then you say, well, if we want to do a cross chain swap, then we need this atomicity property. Oh wait, if somebody walks away, then uh, you're uh, basically stealing from someone. You, you know, you're, you're inconveniencing them. But but wait yet yet again, you know, these things have been known in finance since the Renaissance. You know how, how to deal with these things. You know. It's all uh, you know, options and all this other financial machinery. And there is the barrier because uh, you know, I'm on a program committee for mixed computer science um, um, economics uh, to, you know, conference. And uh, for the first time I've read uh, you know, math papers by economists. And let me tell you, it makes me feel much better about the rigor of the um, mathematics uh, used in computer science. You know, mathematicians sniff at computer scientists. Well, you know, I, I sniff at uh, economists. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that on, on the recording, but uh, the uh, but the, the ideas aren't hard. It's just they're kind of wrapped in this uh, jargon. And so, you know, it's, explaining... it, it's more the social aspects that you were talking about. There, are, I mean, you can't just gain directly. You can do that for other kind of reasons. They can still drag the system or, or try to bias the system and certain behavior, and 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 those are uh, usually beyond uh, what's traditional. You gain from uh, uh, from 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 directly interacting on business. Well, I think a lot of our students have used PayPal, right. and on PayPal, there's always a danger that you're being scammed. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, uh, and so in some sense, they'll have an intuitive understanding of this because you know they're used to. Um, you know, PayPal scams, uh, catfishing, all these, you know, the, you know, even my kids, uh, you know, when they were third grade, uh, they were taught not to, you know, to, to be aware of, uh, you know, over friendly people on Facebook and so on. Right. So, so, so I, I think, you know, our students have a good intuitive understanding of the, uh, you know, treacherous nature of, uh, you know, of the world. And so I've never had any, any trouble convincing them that, uh, you know, um, blockchain-like properties are, are useful. Hey, Rui, uh, Rui has a question. Hi, Ali. Uh, thank you. Rui Oliveira from Inesc Tech and University of Minho. Uh, well, congrats for, for your talk and actually your, your crusade for, for clarifying many of, many of these things that we've been working on for a long time. And actually, uh, somehow following up of, of, of um, Palmieri's uh, question, the thing, uh, the thing about not having uh, uh, a concise model, uh, um, uh, 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 semantics, uh, the, the correctness criteria of what we are, of the tool, uh, upon which we want to, 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 to develop things, it's really bothering. Uh, and, and that's at a, a different scale, a much higher scale than it was when we start working with, with eventual consistency. Um, so uh, whenever we teach our students uh, about acid properties and in particular isolation, uh, all, this, all this complexity, all these uh, sometimes difficult to grasp aspects, we can promise them that once they, they have this, once they have this uh, middleware, then everything will be easy on top of that. Um, with all the, 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 the blockchain thing, I, I can see that everyone applies this to all, everything they, they do since they, they get up until they, they, they go to bed. But I cannot understand how you can actually do something other than cryptocurrency um, uh, without without the the the, the correctness, correctness criteria that you 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 just uh, talked about. So so there, there there are 
plenty of things that are not cryptocurrency that you can transfer, but they, they're all assets in some sense. You know, if it's not a, um, if it's not a Bitcoin, <clears throat> then it's a, you know, a tokenized, uh, you know, deed to a car or something like that. So, so formally, you know, it, it, it's, it's all roughly the same. The um, lack of abstraction is currently a barrier I don't know whether this is inherently a difficult field to abstract, or we just haven't uh, found uh, the right uh, ones uh, yet. So, so all of these composing these uh, protocols, you know, remains kind of a challenge. You know, some properties compose, some properties uh, don't uh, compose. Part of the problem is that this is uh, also a security problem, and security doesn't respect abstraction boundaries. You have an intelligent adversary who uh, can uh, find can find the cracks in your armor and uh, take advantage of uh, minor discrepancies between uh, different layers of abstraction. So from a formal point of view, like any other security problem, you come up with a, uh, a threat model and you say, this is our formal threat model. And then you pray that this is uh, uh, sound. And uh, then you prove things with respect to the threat model. And uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think that I think we're kind of stuck with that uh, model for now. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much again, Morris. Um, uh, so we uh, this is the end of the keynote talk. Uh, we have a ten minutes break. Uh, so let's be back at ten fifteen. Uh, so then uh, the, the next session is chaired by Amy. Uh, if you are a speaker, please uh, uh, recognize yourself for Amy. Uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you, everybody. Um, just a reminder to go on gather if you want to um, go chat uh, with others or use Slack. Um, if you want to test your equipment, we'll be here. Uh, feel free to just share your screen. As soon as you, you, you jump online, we'll promote you as a as a co-host, so you'll be able to, to share your screen. If there is the presenter is different than the one uh, that indicated on the Google uh, form, or when you upload your videos, please let us know. So we will, uh, we will um, upgrade you as a co-host. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Maurice. Uh, hello, can you hear me? <laughs>